if God intended man to be a spacefaring species, he would have given us a moon. This quote is by Kraft Ericke in 1984, and I like the way he stirs the words around from an earlier quote, something about flying. And I like to use it to set the mood for why the moon. Oh, the moon, it's close. It's only a quarter of a million miles away, but it's close in space vernacular. It's three days away using proven propulsion for human transport, hydrogen and oxygen. And this allows for resupply. And there's multiple launch windows every month. So you can have a trickle of parts and supplies going to whatever your installation is on the moon. And we all know that when you go into space, you have all this equipment that keeps you alive. And all of that equipment is serial number 001. And every once in a while, the engineers might design something that breaks. And so it's good to have spare parts. We're learning this on the International Space Station. After 18 years, it's a well-honed machine, but we're still learning it. When we go to another planetary surface, if it's close, like the moon, we can get spare parts. The moon, it's interesting. It's a planetary-sized body. It has the surface area nearly equal to the combined continents of North and South America. Lots of places to live. Early Earth history has been obliterated on Earth due to geologic processes. However, the moon being in the same vicinity as the Earth has preserved the early history of Earth in the solar system and its climate. So we can go to the moon to learn about Earth. And then the moon is a natural laboratory. It has, it has a stable surface. It has no atmosphere. It has, it has fractional gravity. Fractional gravity to do scientific investigations where you can look at physical processes. You can look at life processes. And if this is planet Earth, we know a lot about life on Earth and physical processes. By definition, the gravity is one. And then we have the International Space Station. And it has microgravity. That's one millionth of the gravity on Earth. It's close enough to zero to actually call it zero, even though it's technically not zero. We refer to it as zero gravity. And we have been learning over the last 18 years a lot about life processes and physical processes on the International Space Station, and we're continuing to learn more. Earth, space station, we know almost nothing in between the gravity levels. So returning to the moon at one sixth gravity will allow us to study the physical sciences and the life sciences in a fractional gravity environment. The moon is a destination uh, worthy in its own right. The moon, it's useful besides just places to live. It's useful for its resources. And we call this in situ resource utilization. It's something engineers think up. But basically what it is, is you don't need to carry everything for a sustained presence on another planet with you from Mother Earth. Particularly things that you need by the thousands, if not tens of thousands of tons. Not pounds, tons. Things like bricks, cement, mortar, glass, powder for 3D printing. We're 3D printing with lunar regulus simulant at the Kennedy Space Center. Really neat stuff. So these are things that you need, bulk materials, simply for their physical properties, 
or their chemical properties like rocket propellant. We have learned rather recently something we didn't know during the Apollo days. We have learned that there's water on the moon. It's in the polar regions inside of craters that are so deep the light of the sun never shines there. And it gets cold and water gets trapped there over time. And we know that there's vast quantities of water in the form of ice and frost in these craters in the poles on the moon. And there's solar energy on the moon. Near the poles, around the rims of these craters, you have near continuous solar energy. So you have this beautiful juxtaposition of energy and resources right next to each other. This involves using chemistry to win these resources. And rocket scientists or rocket engineers, if you mention chemistry, they typically hide under the desk because if they like chemistry, they'd be chemists. They wouldn't be aerospace mechanical engineers. And so the kind of chemistry we're talking about to make these bricks and mortar and cement and, and rocket fuel by taking the water and you can make the best rocket propellant we currently have for human transport, hydrogen and oxygen. And these require basic chemistry. Chemistry that is something 19th century industrial chemistry would do. The chemistry we're talking about is 1850 kind of chemistry. And many of these processes, smelting, melting, sintering, the Romans could have done. So, there will be challenges in using these resources on the moon because of the fractional gravity environment. We will be learning. We'll need all those spare parts, but the chemistry is understood. Now, the low gravity of the moon has other utility besides its scientific utility. And I like to use this to get into the tyranny of the rocket equation. Oh, and I, I want to point out, I've got the latest NASA computer-generated fonts. <laughs> These fonts are so good, they make it look like your slides are handwritten. <laughs> now, the rocket equation, it's a momentum balance done on a rocket, first formulated by Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, Russian scientist. And it involves two, two inputs. The magnitude of the gravity field that you are negotiating in and the type of rocket propellant that you have chosen. And you plug these into the rocket equation, turn the crank, and out comes the percent of your rocket that has to be propellant. And you must abide by this or your rocket will be repossessed by the planet from whence it came. <laughs> Let's do this. Let's do this now. For planet Earth, going into what we call low Earth orbit, well, gravity, okay? It is what it is. Take it or leave it. Um, type of propellant. Let's choose the most energetic propellant we have for human transport that extends the maximum you can get from chemistry. You plug that into the rocket equation, you turn the crank, and your rocket is 85 to 90 percent propellant. That means everything you think of as a rocket is 10 to 15 percent. All that stuff that sits on the launch pad that you see, 10 to 15 percent. The actual usable payload that goes into orbit is about one and a half percent. Wow. Let's compare this to other vehicles, earthly vehicles that we are used to, to seeing. Let's look at land and sea vehicles, cars, trucks, trades, boats, ships. These things are 3 to 8% propellant and made out of billets of steel. They are incredibly robust. Now, move to aviation. Okay, cargo planes, 30 to 40% propellant. These are truly lightweight structures. They 
are made out of aluminum and epoxy graphite composites. They are designed by engineers. You have to roll your engineering nickels around in order to make these airframes and to make them work. But in spite of that, our aviation industry on Earth is robust, routine, and reusable. Airplanes, reusable. Rockets leaving Earth, 85 to 90%. They're not even in the same class. In fact, rockets are closer to explosive devices than any vehicles that we are used to using. Rockets are on the edge of our engineering ability to even make and pay for. So, let's apply the rocket equation to the moon. Oh, a rocket going from the surface of the moon into orbit 40% propellant. And that's complements of the moon having one-sixth of gravity of Earth. 40%. Notice, rockets on the moon are akin to the same structures that we use in aviation industry on Earth. So rockets on the moon will be routine, robust, and reusable. We could take resources that we win from the lunar environment and we can move them from point to point on the lunar surface. We can put them into orbit around the moon, particularly rocket propellant, so we could fuel up our rockets and go elsewhere. Now, oh, I love this picture. This is a picture out of one of the windows in space station. And we are somewhere over China, looking past the Himalayas into India. And if you know where to look in this picture, Mount Everest is right there. It's the big mountain sticking up. You could all see it. <laughs> it's really in there. Now, I like to use this to illustrate a concept of the frontier. Imagine now that you're a rookie astronaut, you're going up to the space station, and you know that dozens of astronauts have looked out this window. And these dozens of astronauts before you have taken tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of pictures. And you could get yourself in the warped mindset that why should I even bother to take a picture? Because it's already been done. But then you need to realize that you are in a frontier and there's always new discoveries to be made, oftentimes just by changing the way you make the observation. So, take this window. Many have been there before. I'm going to take the camera and set it up a little differently. And whoa, set it up for nighttime. It's the same planet, the same window, the same view, but now you're making a new observation. But wait, there's more. Change the settings again, and look at that. Wow, this is a 30-minute time exposure. Isn't that cool? You can see a lot of natural phenomenology in here that escapes your eye unless you make a time exposure. So when you're in a frontier, the very concept of been there, done that does not apply. Exploration is not a bucket list where you simply check off places that you have been. The real benefit by a society that, has, uh, uh, that explores, the real benefit is having a sustained presence in the frontier. And those societies with a sustained presence get to define the cultural and political rules of engagement. So, why the moon? The moon is the next logical step. It's close, it's interesting, it's useful. We could take the resources from the moon and use them to explore anywhere else we want in the solar system. Now, I took the rocket equation and I worked it backwards. And I increase the size of Earth, which increases its gravity and its input into the rocket equation. And I wanted to see how much larger Earth would have to be before it would not be possible to launch a rocket into space with any usable payload. 
And my numbers turned out 10 to 15%. So think about that. If earth were just a little bit bigger, we might be a species, a single planet species, we might not even be able to leave the planet. And this is all compliments of the tyranny from the rocket equation. And fortunately, earth is just small enough so that we can escape and contaminate the rest of the solar system. <laughs> they can let us out of the Petri dish of earth. And to help break the tyranny of this rocket equation, you could either develop a system that doesn't use rockets. Ooh, that would be neat. Nobody's been smart enough to do that yet. But maybe somebody out here will figure out a way to do this. Or you can go to other planetary surfaces that have reduced gravity and get the resources you need there, the resources that you need by the thousands of tons or the tens of thousands of tons so you don't have to take all that stuff from planet Earth. Thank you. <laughs>